Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I stand here this morning in awe, uh, and I think of what my mentors would have said. And I remember, I am dating myself. I used to put in Harrington rods, and when pedicle screws came in, I took Professor George Thomas, who wrote everything about the vascular anatomy to the clinic, and he was in his 80s, and I showed him my first pedicle screws. And he looked at this, and he goes like, you don't get much more with those rods than I got with my Harrington rods. And I was so angry at him. And today I realized he was, and I realized that he was right. We put, put me on this path to do better for our patients. These are my disclosures. Um, so preoperative planning. We all know it's very important to plan. Um, this is one of the cases that CJ did many, uh, many years ago. Um, and success doesn't just happen, we plan for it. So historically, I'm an old surgeon, what do we do? You see a patient, you order the x-rays, you measure it in clinic. I still had a ruler with a pencil. Um, it makes the consultation really long. Then we go and we plan the surgery on the back end. We used PowerPoint to, to rotate the patient. And then we got surgery map and all kinds of stuff. Then the patient comes back to the appointment and without any visual aid, you're trying to explain to this, now I heard the mentored patient over 60, um, what you're gonna do, and they go like, yes, doctor, whatever you wanna do, doctor, that's fine. Long appointment, finally we get to the surgery, we have the best intentions to do it well, you get tired at the end of the case, you bend the rod, you put it in, and you go like, I need more lordosis, because we were taught lordosis is important. And then patient comes post-op visit, you measure it in clinic, and the rod fracture, uh, the rod is fractured, you have pseudoarthrosis, the patient's still standing like this, and you go like, it's okay, it's okay. It was terrible, okay? Real time, what do we no do now? Actually, my schedule gets now scrutinized, and I have a deformity practice, but every now and then somebody slips in with a leg pain without a deformity, and I see them. The x-rays get pre-ordered when the patient comes in checks in, immediately gets this amazing biplanar x-ray. Remember, we didn't have biplanars those days. You see the patient in the room with accurate measurements right there. And you can show the patient not only the x-rays, but you can show him the, the view that Greg just showed us. High patient satisfaction because you're approaching this problem scientific. We have our ODI scores, we have our VAS scores, we have all of this, the disability score. So I have this patient with a minor curve but a disability score of 66. I have this patient with a 75 degree score with a disability score of 14. I saw one last week. And I can tell her, it doesn't matter that it's 75. You've got all your mobility, I'll watch you, I'll see when you get your translation, I know you'll come back, but I cannot make you functionally better I can give you a pretty x-ray. So I think we've at least come some, some, somewhere. Now we request the plan. Um, there's a virtual correction, as we still see this morning, and we'll see that we do the surgery. Not only does it take away the time in the surgery, the incorrectness, the inconsistency, it gives you a sense of security. I can tell you that morning when those rods do not show up, I'm irritated. I am irritated because after all these years, I have found a workflow that I can rely on. Patient comes back, post-op visit, again, the same measurements, and there's real numbers that you can show the patient. And the best part of that is the AI afterwards, where you can learn how bad you are. And that is what David Uyang showed this morning. So if you look how this adaptive spine intelligence developed, there was the SRS cl classification by SWAP, and then it was um, redesigned by Moal, and then we got the unit rods cleared in 2014, and then in 2017, we started with the predictive modeling, and then Medtronic came on the scene, and I hope that we're moving forward as a quantum leap. This is an exciting conference just to be part of this, and it's gonna go down in my memoirs. So why unit? We've seen this before. Uh, I think this was shown in somebody's t uh, talk, how bad we are when we think we're good. Actually, it shows the arrogance of surgeons in general, okay? 
So let me give you an idea. Here are three patients. They're all female and have adult deformity. As we showed this morning, I think Dr. Ferran showed how different patients are. So plan A, patient A, this is a plan that we can do. Surgical plan, L3 to S1 A lift, L3 S1 T lift, T10 pelvis, PS, post pierce spinal fusion. You have your pre-op measures and your plan there. Patient B, again, T10 to the pelvis, but completely different. This pelvic incidence is 58, there's your plan. L2, uh, L3 to S1 T lift, T10 to the ILAC posterior fusion, and um, her SVA is much different than the previous patient, which was um, 40, 43, and this one is 110, okay? This patient, same surgery, T10 to the pelvis, SVA is 118.2 so millimeters, so she's gonna need a PSO. All th three patients are T T10 to the pelvis. Before we had the ability to do this planning, you would take these patients to the operating room, your scheduler would code for a 12-level fusion, and then you would add things and add it in your note. Now you can get there and you can plan this exactly, and you can also methodically decide what to do the day of surgery. Place the screws, do the rods, then you're gonna do this and this, and then if the patient is stable, you do that quick PSO. It, it, it is just magic for me. Here are the three patients, as you can see, all T10 to the pelvis, all different rods, and there you can see all different shapes, the distribution for doses, L4 is one, everything is different, the apex of the curve, where they are in space, and most of all the compensatory mechanisms, which we can now dial in because we have enough patients. This is what it looks like. This is what Greg is trying to show you. There's my plan. This was last year, in that window between two pandemics. These were the cases we were doing. And then if you click on the date, you can see um, which patient is there and you can pull it up and then approve your plan, which he will show us in a little bit. Having this ability to pre-plan your rod, but not only the rod, pre-plan your surgery and virtually correct your patient, complete paradigm shift. We rely on software and preoperative measurements, which is not unfamiliar to the orthopedic surgeon or now the spine surgeons, which includes neuro and spine. And when we first analyzed my results before this 2000 onwards till 2014, I thought it was good, okay? I contoured the rod to the patient. Now we are contouring the patient to the rod. I had on average overcorrected my patients by 30 degrees in the lumbar lordosis. On average. That's why I had a high PJK rate and everybody had it. In the beginning 2010, this was designated one of the topics that the SRS wanted to get clarity on was PJK because we did not understand what we were doing to our patients. Here's a perfect example. We've just put in this rod. It's not MIS, Greg, I apologize. We're still in the dark ages, okay? And then you can see that um, you put the rod in right there, and that rod is nowhere a fit for that patient. So it helps you to see, okay, because patients do relax on the table. It doesn't matter if you take extension views or traction views or whatever, patients do relax. So what I've learned is you get the rod, you get the plan, and then you put it in the wound early to make sure that you still need to do the things that you had planned. Because if they had relaxed and you had planned four Smith-Peters and osteotomies, you might not need to do it at that time. So these are our early results that I just alluded to. And this was done by one of my medical students who is now in a fellowship in arthroplasty. I think I scared him away completely. Um, and it showed that I had a significant, um, um, what do you call it? Indica uh, my, my, pel my lumbar lordosis was corrected significantly, my sacral slope and pelvic tilt, but it was overcorrected. Okay? This is a. Um, Another article that showed that we have 100% um, achieved the PI minus LL of under 10, um, and that we are two, 
2.6 times more likely to achieve our correction goals when we use patient-specific rods. So again, vulnerable, we are here to be open to learn. This is an analysis of my 185 cases. I'm not as meticulous as David. That's why he didn't include my cases in his analysis, because it would make him look bad. So I, there's my pre-op values, PI minus LL. Everything is um, a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So we're achieving our plans for PI minus LL, SVA, pelvic tilt, the same. Um, actually very good in pelvic tilt from plan to finding it. And then thoracic kyphosis compensatory, um, we're seeing that we're getting a little bit more thoracic kyphosis. So this is how the machine is going to learn, because what we have with 3,000 cases is this is the compensatory. If we have 7,000 cases with a broader range, genetically different, gender different, we might learn something more about the compensatory parts that we don't fuse. So overall, the unit has significant improved correction in the sagittal plane. We are 2.6 times more likely to correct across key parameters in the sagittal plane, which I just showed you, and 3.8 times more likely to correct across key parameters when a PSO is involved. So again, this is a pre-op patient. This is a plan with no predictive modeling. So nobody would do that, and we did. In the old days, we go like, oh, this patient needs an L3 PSO. And then we go like, she'll be OK. They'll balance out. That's all that we knew, that they would balance out. But we didn't know who would not. Okay? So with the predictive model, you can actually now see where this patient's head is. And now you can see that this patient has a secondary driver in the cervicothoracic junction. So when we look at this iterative virtuous circle, which Greg is showing us, you can plan, you can execute, and you can analyze. Other advantages of using a unit rod, whether we want to know it or not, doesn't matter what you use, we do notch the rod. We know, uh, if you look at the metallurgy, that we break rods. So 9.0% rod fracture rate in adult spinal deformity. And when a PSO is performed with two rods, 22%. With um, patient-specific rods, we're down to 2.2% and 4.7% of a PSO. Fra current fracture rate for every rod, regardless of the underlying deformity correction, is 1%. That is significant. For every reoperation that you have to do in the first six months, you're adding a cost of about $150,000 to that patient's insurance. Um, I'm going to, for the interest of time, not go over the other rod fracture data. The take-home message is that when you do this, and we have a lot to learn, but now we have some form of predictable outcome. Whether the outcome is correct, we don't know. But we have the data, and you can at least assure your patient that you're going to do the best, and you can show them a picture of what they're going to look like afterwards, which is magical for the patients to see. And when you tell a patient that has been really stooped over, that when we're done with your surgery, you're going to be here. They want to take a picture of the cell phone off your screen. They say, I want to show my kids that I can be straight up. It's, it's amazing the, the assurance the surgeons get when you do that surgery and you know you've dropped that rod, you can walk away. And I don't have to worry and every day ask the resident, have you taken the x-rays? Have you taken the x-rays? Is she upright? Have we measured her? It's the things that we always did, but it's just magical. So I hope that everybody that's here has an interest and will embrace this technology for the advantage of our patients. So thank you very much.